Now I guess I don't spend a few minutes for the introduction. So uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome Scott Didams as our as our colloquium speaker and today. Scott got his uh, PhD in 1996 from the University of New Mexico, where I'm sure he overlapped with quite a few of our colleagues here. I'm sure he has some stories. <laughs> and also he became a, a postdoc at GILA at National Institute of Science and Technology and the University of, of Colorado at Boulder, obviously, according to his uh, Zoom background, where he is now. So he is now currently a fellow at NIST, which is the highest rank and a professor of physics at the University of Colorado. And uh, if, you, if you look at his page, he received numerous awards for his research including the Rabi Award, the Arthur Fleming Award, Presidential Career Award, Gold and Silver Medals from the Department of Commerce, many, many others. So he works in a really exciting area, these ultra-fast lasers and optical frequency combs, with applications going from a test of fundamental physics to building ever more precise atomic clocks and ultra-sensitive spectroscopy. So if you just look at the couple of years of the, of the papers of his, from his group, you will find everything from controlling this quantum state of a single molecule to, and doing spectroscopy over the whole infrared range in real time over biomolecules, like from three to 30 micrometers, which is mind boggling. And all the way to just sitting and continuously monitoring the passage of time over days and months with, with again mind-boggling precision. Do you know that you can, for example, measure the size of the Earth, the shape of the Earth, the accuracy of one centimeter in different points, just because, you know, the gravity dilates the flow of time and they can do it with this accuracy, centimeter accuracy, can you imagine that? Or you type time.gov in your web browser and you will get to the next web page and they will scorn your computer clock for being off by a few milliseconds. Okay, it's very exciting. I can go on and on, but uh, I better stop and let you hear it directly from Scott. So great. Scott, okay. So can you all uh, see that? See my screen? Yes. Yes. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much. That was a very uh, kind introduction. And um, yeah, it's the strange times we find ourselves in, but it's, it's really a pleasure to be able to spend an hour or so with you and uh, you know, chat with a few of you on the side also and share a little bit about the work that I'm involved in in Boulder. So I think that the official title of my talk was Synthesizing Light, um, but I added this subtitle, 20 Years of Optical Frequency Combs and um, I, my, my goal in this talk will be to introduce you to this technology of optical frequency combs, kind of how they work, what they're, why they might be interesting, and, and some of the applications and work that we have been doing with them. You know, I'll focus more on the recent work, um, but there's been a, a really wonderful history over the past 20 years. So it's, um, let's get going on that. So you might not have known, but there's, uh, birthday going on this year for this tool called the optical frequency comb and at least there's the the major publications that really launched this field um, were came out of Boulder and um, the Max Planck Institute for quantum optics the groups of John Hall and Boulder who where I was doing my postdoc at the time and Ted Hench's group in Garching and it was in 2000 that these, these three papers were released that really launched the field and demonstrated that you could use this tool of a mode lock laser to synthesize light and to, to directly connect optical and microwave domains. Now, that, that, that of course isn't the full story. The, the first ideas and some implementations and proposals had been kicking around for a few decades before that, mainly in, in the group of Ted Hinch when he was at Stanford, but then in other groups and, and some of his students later in the 90s and others in Germany. So, so it's, um, you know, while, while with most stories it's hard to find exactly the beginning, I think uh, there was kind of a step function that occurred in 2000 that really launched this field. 
so the, the key aspect of a frequency comb I try to capture in this slide is that it, it's a tool that unites the electromagnetic spectrum. So the, the field of electricity and magnetism, of course, is fully described by Maxwell's equations. And it's quite interesting that we have such a fundamental theory that describes everything from radio waves to the highest frequencies we can generate. Yet the technologies that we use and the implementations of these technologies um, realized a huge gap in the EM spectrum between, for example, electronics and optics that um, it took nearly 100 years to bridge this gap. And, and that's what we try to capture in this figure here where we're plotting the frequency of the electromagnetic radiation and um, against time over which devices and tools and technologies evolved. So in, in the radio frequency domain, really the, the starting point from, for the generation of coherent human controlled electromagnetic waves was in the, in the just spectacular experiments of Heinrich Hertz. And of course, this launched a whole series of, of experiments, technologies, things that we completely rely on now for radio communications and navigation over you know, the, the more than 150 year history. In the optical domain, coherent light really began in 1960 with the introduction, the invention of the laser. And of course, that's introduced a, a, another parallel technological and scientific channel that has led to tremendous advances in you know, a wide range of fields, both fundamental and applied. And, and for example, you know, we have really extreme resolution and tremendous bandwidths. In, at a place like NIST, we're very interested in clocks that tick at optical frequencies. You know, but maybe, maybe from a technological point of view, fiber communications is one example of a technology that is just epitomized by what you can do with light. But for, for nearly 40 years, there was not a possibility to phase coherently connect the electronic domain and the optical domain. And that inhibited kind of the connection between these technological and scientific realms. But in, in 2000, there was the introduction of the frequency comb that for the first time really uniformly and, and in a simple way um, expanded control, coherent control over the full electromagnetic spectrum. And this has introduced some of the topics that I'll talk about today from optical clocks to, to um, precision spectroscopy. And, you know, maybe in the future it will introduce or it will allow us to make clocks at nuclear frequencies. There will be technologies that will allow clocks and frequency combs to fly in space. And even as we think about pushing the technology of electronics or, or optics down to the chip scale, there will be kind of a seamless integration of optics and electronics. So you might imagine kind of CMOS integrated um, photonic circuits. And I'll, I'll come back to this a little bit later in, in my talk. So, so this is kind of the big landscape and in terms of the frequency and time space. And again, the, the exciting thing that I want to relate to you, and of course that's you know, the, the landmark experiments were done 20 years ago. So I, I want to talk to you about this tool called the frequency comb and how it's um, impacted and being used in a wide range of science and technology. So my outline will, will be a, as follows. I'll, I'll give you a little bit more background on, you know, the, I call the multiple faces. You know, how, how do you understand an optical frequency comb? How does it work? What are some of the platforms? I mean, a lot of the interesting work is in the, in the optical physics of developing the, the laser platforms that make frequency combs. And then I'll spend some time telling you in particular about some of the applications that I'm interested in and use these, these combs for, and then conclude with a little bit about what the future might hold. So I like this picture from, from Marco Lonkar's group at Harvard. You know, you can look at a frequency comb on many different levels. So, so there's a very simple picture, um, you know, the strong analogy to the comb you would use for your hair and uh, a distinct array of optical frequencies, um, each tooth a slightly different color. So um, 
Another view of a frequency comb is one that is incorrect. So if you want to Google the term, um, don't, well, you, you can Google laser comb, but if you Google laser comb, the, the top hit will be from the Hairmax company. And that, that kind of looks a little bit like a comb of light there, but this is something that is used to stimulate the follicles on your scalp. Um, I don't know, it's kind of interesting. They all, this company also started in 2000, so maybe there was a, a connection to the scientific laser comb I'm gonna tell you about, but, but this is not the type of comb um, I'll discuss in the, in the rest of this talk. So, so back to the picture of the comb is an array of optical frequencies with uniform spacing. With, without knowing at all how one gets this or how it's generated, we can construct this picture of this evenly spaced array of optical frequencies and write a very simple equation that would describe the frequency of, of every tooth. Okay, and that's, that's what I've written there. There would be, say, a uniform spacing between the teeth. And the teeth, if you followed them all the way back to DC, there might be an offset. So there's, there, it, they aren't pure harmonics of the mode spacing, but there's a small offset in the frequency. So this is, this is, in fact, all one needs to know really mathematically to talk about frequency combs. In the time domain, we have a picture like I've drawn here where a frequency comb that the Fourier transform of, of what I showed on the previous slide really um, turns into a train of near identical pulses. And the important aspect is there's coherence from pulse to pulse. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a little more descriptive picture in a few minutes. But here we would have, now we see that the inverse of that mode spacing is the time separation between the pulses. And I mentioned that the pulses need to be near identical, but because they, they don't actually have to be identical. For example, if you talk about realistic sources for such combs, this offset frequency I've mentioned is related to the slipping of the, the group velocity with respect to the phase velocity of the light that makes up this pulse train. So, so we, we have in a frequency comb this interesting opportunity through the offset frequency I described a few slides ago to have access to the carrier envelope phase. So this provides kind of a, a, a unique tool to not only measure and control light, but use that light and that property of light in a new way. But the, the real key is that the pulses are near identical and repetitive with coherence from pulse to pulse, and, and you would still get a comb more generally with chirp pulses or with frequency modulated lasers, et cetera. So that's, that, that's kind of a, a, maybe a physicist picture of a, of a frequency comb. Another picture I really like is that of an optical clockwork or a set of gears. And, and here, think of this set of gears as performing simultaneously three different modes of operation. But for example, um, I mean, the, the key aspect of the comb is that it acts as a multiplier. So if you were to engage a microwave frequency with this comb, then that gear would act to multiply up the frequency to optical waves. And in fact, there's not just one optical wave, and there's lots of waves that come out. And each of those waves would be, um, for example, in this me mechanistic picture, would have one additional tooth on the gear if you wanted. So that would be the spacing of the comb I, I showed you already. The, the, the Clockwork at the same time can run in reverse. So we could control the entire apparatus with one optical wave. So we send in a wave and then we run the gears in reverse and out comes the microwave. And in this case, the microwave output is the pulses of light that this frequency comb generates. Another way to operate it is, and, and that's due to the fact that, you know, the, the optical spectrum, the, the bandwidth that we can have in such an optical spectrum could be hundreds of terahertz. And so the, the connection from one optical mode to the other is made again via this comb where one could look at controlling one tooth or one gear of the clockwork. And you could also get at the output another, all the other colors. So these modes of operation turn out to be uh, extremely powerful and extremely useful for a variety of different experiments and, and tools that we use the frequency comb for. 
So let's move on then kind of from these simple pictures and, and think a little bit more and talk a little bit more in detail about how, how this clockwork or this gear work actually functions. So, so a picture that, that I like to, to use to explain this is to begin with a continuous wave, that's a CW laser, where one would just have a, a continuous stream of oscillations of an electromagnetic field here. And the, the spacing of these would be at a time t. For light, that might be one or two femtoseconds, the spacing of the, of the light waves. The Fourier transform shown here on the right is a single delta function-like feature, okay? But now let's imagine if we could modulate that, that light wave. Let's say that we had a, an ultra-fast modulator that could turn on and off the light wave in perfect synchrony with the underlying oscillations of light. So for example, in this case, I drew the period of the modulation to be every 10 cycles of the light wave, okay? And you could recognize that this, this forms a rudimentary counter of, of the, the cycles of light. It forms a rudimentary gearbox in that if I can count the modulation period or control the modulation period and somehow I could directly tie it via this inter, integer relationship to the cycles of light, then I would know, for example, every 10 periods of this modulation is, is or I'm sorry, every one period of the modulation is 10 cycles of light. The frequency domain picture shows up as this, uh, now we start to get, get a comb of light. And the, the unique feature here that you should note is that these frequencies now are pure integer um, multiples of the mode spacing or of the repetition rate, our modulation rate. So, so if this was a way in which actual physical lasers and devices operated, there would have been no Nobel Prize for Henshin Hall, or at least maybe the Nobel Prize would have come back in the 1960s when people first developed mode lock lasers. But the, the, the key realization was that actually lasers don't, or devices that make frequency combs don't really work that way. And that's because you will have dispersion in, in any kind of laser or light generating cavity. And the role of that dispersion is, again, as I alluded to, is it causes the group velocity to slip or to be delayed with respect to the phase velocity. And you might see that as a fatal flaw initially, but if we can keep track of that small slip from each modulated pulse to the next, then we still can maintain this connection between the, the RF domain and the optical domain. And that in fact is the connection that comes from this offset frequency. So this was a real breakthrough in the year 2000 is, is convenient ways to measure and control this offset frequency, which gave us control over this carrier envelope phase slip and allowed us to make for the first time a gear work that could, could connect in this very simple way, the optical and microwave domains. So controlling and measuring this offset frequency was a big deal. And, and the reason why that did not happen early on is there were not good nonlinear optical techniques to expand the spectrum of a laser or of a frequency comb to, ex to an octave bandwidth. And if you were able to do that, and that is in fact what happened in 2000 was for the first time we could make octave spanning coherent optical spectra. When you can do that, you can take light from one side of the spectrum use some nonlinear optics to double its frequency and heterodyne against light on the short side of the spectrum or in the blue side of the spectrum, and that directly gives you this offset frequency. To do that, we needed, you know, what some at that time dubbed a seriously nonlinear fiber. So this is where interesting and fun nonlinear optics enters. These are kind of fibers that, um, you know, are more common now and people understand these, but in the 90s, it was really work of Philip Russell and, and others working around him who devised and, and understood these fibers as kind of photonic band gap structures. And so this is a silica fiber where there's air holes that run along the entire length of the fiber, but inside there's a small defect and that's where the light is guided. And by changing the, the 
pitch, the spacing of the holes and the filling factor of the holes, a really interesting thing happens is that you can control the group velocity dispersion of the light. And that allowed um, scientists at that time, and this was the, the first demonstration with this super continuum was a group out of Bell Labs at that time, allowed them to, to move the dispersion zero crossing down to um, wavelengths around 800 nanometers where lasers could conveniently excite that and go from kind of narrow band laser uh, pumping such a fiber to really a white light super continuum. And, and here's a picture of that and you see the, the glorious colors coming out of this fiber. And I know there's, there's folks in, in your faculty who you know, are involved in these experiments as well. But when you see this for the first time, it's just amazing. So that, that nonlinear fiber gave us the octave of spectrum that allowed us to, to do the first self-referencing measurements to, to measure the offset frequency. There is a bit of a historical note. It was a, another postdoc and myself, David Jones, and I copied a few pages from our lab book and actually put them in this 70th birthday um, publication for John Hall back in 2000 five or so. Um, and, and just to, the, the point I wanted to make here was that um, the interesting one that, that this technology really worked from the very beginning. I think we got the, the first fiber from Lucent or from Bell Labs right around the beginning of October in 1999. And as soon as we were able to put it into the laser, you could see this input spectrum, we could generate very broad white light octave spectrum going from you know 500 nanometers all the way out into the near infrared and with a very simple type of nonlinear interferometer we could immediately observe this offset frequency so it was it was one of the most and and actually has continued to be one of the most wonderful experiments to work on because it's a bit the the opposite of murphy's law is from the very beginning things just worked uh, magically well once the, the offset frequency was measured, it allowed us to make this connection I illustrated between the time and frequency domains. So we could perform a cross correlation between pulse N and N plus one that came out of the laser, this titanium sapphire laser at that time, and measure with reasonable precision the, the slippage from the peak of, of the interference of the carriers of these two pulses to the envelope. And then as we change the ratio of the offset frequency of the rep rate, we could see that there was indeed a linear relationship between this, this uh, slipping between the carry and the envelope. So that really cemented this, this gear box picture and the idea that you could really rigorously connect microwaves to optical um, fields using this technology. So, so of course, there's, there's, that's the offset frequency. There's, there's also the mode spacing, which you might wonder, well, how do you measure and control that? Of course, this is usually occurring at a, at a much lower rate. You know, the typical spacing is meg hundreds of megahertz to gigahertz. So one can just photo detect the rate at which pulses come. And then you could compare it to a microwave reference. And so with some sort of laser servo technology, we can in fact force those to be equal. However, another way to do this, and this is how we make optical clocks, is to instead um, use the heterodyne between an optical reference, say the, the, the pendulum of an optical clock, the laser that is probing, for example, an atom or an ion in such clocks, and that's a very stable laser. And we can use that via a heterodyne with one tooth of the comb to control the entire comb. And a little bit of math shows you that then the repetition rate is tied essentially to this optical frequency divided by N. So here you kind of see this, this optical frequency divider math that I showed you, you know, kind of qualitatively works with the, with the gear picture of the comb. So, which technique you use here depends a bit on some of the tools you might have and what you want to accomplish. But for the state-of-the-art references, frequency references, a microwave reference might, the best ones might give you 13 digits of precision in one second. But optical references now are the, the most stable and most accurate electromagnetic oscillators we have. So if we control to the optical domain here, we can be at kind of 10 to the minus 16 in one second. So, so here's a case where optics clearly wins 
over electronics. And, and if you think back to the early picture of this gulf between optical domain and electronics domain, we now have a tool, for example, to, to make oscillators in the optical domain that are very stable, very precise, very low noise, and use frequency cones to convert them, down convert them, to the electrical domain. So that, that is, for example, one of the, the innovations that, that frequency combs enable. And, and for technological purposes, like um, uh, radar systems or remote sensing, uh, that is quite interesting to use. It's also interesting, you know, just for precision microwave spectroscopy to actually use an optical source as your local oscillator. So a question that, that often comes up is how good are the gears? So, you know, here, here's another little gear picture and that, you know, does this gear picture really work? And early on, there were a lot of questions about that, um, particularly as we thought about the nonlinear optics in those systems is, well, could there be a tooth missing, if you would, from the, from the comb? Or, or does, the, does the comb, is it really uniformly spaced? Um, does that simple equation I wrote, does this really apply? And so in the early part of the 2000s and in even continuing up to, you know, just within a few years, this, this for metrologists continues to be a question of, for example, how uniform is the comb? And, and it was really from Hench's group, Thomas Udom, a postdoc and a student before that, who, who cemented in everyone's mind that it, you know, it was as good as you could measure. The inaccuracy of this equation was checked by myself and many others in the community, you know, usually using techniques like this, where you would build two of these gear boxes and then compare them against each other and you build them similarly, but maybe different enough so that you would know that there wasn't a common error in both channels. And there we could see that, you know, down to now even the, the 21st digit, um, you know, this very simple equation is obeyed. Another type of question is that, well, maybe the, the, this equation is correct on average, but the gears are loose. And that would be, you know, maybe the gear picture, the, they aren't perfectly enmeshed, but sometimes they slip and slip forward and backwards a little bit. And this is really a question of what we call phase noise, and it depends on the time scale. But in the best cases, you know, in the optical domain, the, the phase control can be at the tens of milliradian or, less than 10 attosecond time to uh, uh, time resolution. And so that means that, that these gears, even if you think of a gear as being a cycle of light, you know, the, the definition of the gear or the cycle can be subdivided by a factor of 100 or 1,000 even. So you can get down to attosecond precision. And that's also quite important when one uses these short pulses, for example, to probe nonlinear effects that might be sensitive to this carrier envelope phase. Okay, so let's, uh, now I've, I've given you a little bit of a, you know, heuristic description of the frequency comb and, and a more working description. Let's go on and talk about some of the, the laser technology, the different technologies that people use to realize combs. So, so shifting away from the gear picture, you know, a, a laser comb, it, it's not a mechanical device, it's a laser. And, um, so it looks in reality more something like this, where you have a resonator with multiple waves, the, the, the frequencies of the comb running in that, that laser, coherently summing up to be pulses that would come at the output. So, so all frequency comb generating devices have in common a means to enforce the phase synchronization, synchronization between the modes. That's a mode locking technique or phase locking technique that really forces all of these waves to march in order or in synchrony such that uh, they sum up to form a coherent field that's repeated from round trip, one round trip to the other. And, and this can be several different, um, you know, physical mechanisms that I list there. One also needs a cavity and um, the cavity has the function of reducing high frequency noise, of really providing the storage of the light that enables it to be repetitive over some time. And while I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about some comb generating technologies that actually at first look don't need a cavity, for the widest bandwidth combs, we, we, we always need a cavity to reduce the noise if we wanna maintain coherence.
so here physically are, are three mo uh, comb generating platforms that have emerged based on mode lock lasers, um, electro optics, and micro resonator technology or, or integrated photonics. And, you know, all at maybe different stages of maturity, the, the mode lock laser technology presented here is a fiber laser is probably the most mature, you know, and, and the, the differences in some of the key factors or key qualities are shown here on the right. The, the, for mode lock lasers, the, the rate at which pulses are generated is typically in the 100 megahertz to gigahertz range, sometimes maybe up to 10 gigahertz. We use laser gain and there's, there's Kerr nonlinearity that enforces this phase synchronization. Electro-optic combs are quite interesting. They're actually older than mode lock laser combs. And here you, you rely on three-wave mixing, parametric gain, where you're driving some electro-optic crystal, nonlinear crystal with a microwave, and you're modulating CW light. And you use actually this electro-optic effect to do the mode locking. Microresonator combs are, are devices that have generated a huge amount of interest and excitement over the past years because they, they hold that promise of providing a, an approach, a technique to shrink down a, you know, a synthesizer, an optical frequency synthesizer to chip scale and to, to intimately marry it with the electronic technology. These devices, um, because of their small size, tend to have very high repetition rates. They use a four-wave parametric gain for the, for the phase synchronization. And, and that, of course, is kind of synonymous with Kerr lens mode locking. So I'll give you just a, a, a brief highlight of these three technologies. The, the most mature is mode lock lasers. And there's been a wide, wide range of uh, systems this has been demonstrated in. And it's you know now commercial vendors, many of them, make these systems and you could go buy one for your lab if you wanted. Just to highlight a few from, from you know, colleagues around where I live in Boulder, you know, making very robust, all fiber integrated, it's kind of like telecom type technology. So robust that now, you know, companies are spinning off to use this to measure, you know, gas leaks as you see here, methane detection in, in the field. I know, uh, Professor Hans Schussler, also quite interested in work like this. So it's, it's a, a very powerful tool, for example, to use frequency combs as a spectroscopic tool. And, and other companies are even looking at, you know, building tiny versions of these combs, highly integrated, launching them on rockets, because in the, in the future, people think about, you know, uh, someday we're gonna probably replace our GPS network, which is microwave clocks. We'd want to replace that with, with a system of optical clocks or much higher precision devices, not only for, for doing experiments or, or for perhaps navigating us around our planet, but looking out uh, using such networks of, of clocks and combs as a cosmic observatory for, for fundamental physics is something that a lot of people are, are dreaming about. Electro-optic combs, I mentioned that they were actually introduced earlier, in fact, the early 90s. And if you go back, of course, electro-optic modulation, even back into the 60s. But it was a colleague at, at, in Tokyo, Motonobu Kurogi, who introduced this idea of putting an electro-optic modulator inside a cavity and thereby finding a, a very efficient way to build up a comb. And those look like something like this if you measure the spectrum is you know, and this is a frequency spectrum, the power at each comb tooth, and, and it kind of looks like a fat blue line here in the plot. But if you zoom in, there's actual comb teeth distributed throughout this spectrum. So this, these kind of tools were the first ones that were used in frequency metrology experiments, um, both in, in Japan and later in the Hench group. In, and, and even in Boulder, when I started working with John Hall, we were using these kind of frequency combs to attempt to bridge terahertz gaps in an effort to, to overcome this factor of 10,000 or 100,000 between microwave and optical domains. A really exciting advance recently uh, has been uh, pioneered by the Lungkar group out of Harvard, and that's to implement these types of electro-optic combs in, in a much more integrated thin film lithium niobate platform 
where you could imagine again now kind of photonic circuits on a chip. So um, you see here some of the, the little racetrack type resonators and some of the electrical um, uh, gold plating on there that would allow you to dry these devices at microwave frequencies to produce combs like this. So this is an exciting area because it's, it's really headed towards much more potential sophistication in, in the integration of these devices. Such electro-optic combs, um, we've also worked on those in our group. And, and one thing that um, has been quite interesting about them is, is in fact, you, you know, let me back up one slide. These types of systems still have a resonant cavity. Maybe you can see this kind of oval racetrack around there. But it turns out that you could also make such combs just by starting with a CW laser and driving modulation sidebands onto it, you know, say at 10 gigahertz, and you get a, a comb that looks like this. This is a, a fully phase coherent comb connected, um, the, the teeth are spaced by the microwave frequency. And in fact, you can form a short pulse with that. And if you combine with some nonlinear nanophotonics, you can expand the spectrum of this comb from its narrow bandwidth of just a few tens of nanometers up to uh, extremely broad, you know, octave spanning comb. And in fact, you can then perform this same kind of nonlinear interferometry to measure the carrier envelope offset frequency of this comb. And you can have with these types of EO combs now for the first time, kind of an electronic, purely electronic connection from, you know, a 10 gigahertz microwave signal up to the optical domain. So that's something that, that I think is quite exciting. What's, what's hidden a bit here in these slides are not shown is that in order to keep it coherent, one really needs to actually filter out some of the thermal noise that arises from this uh, 10 gigahertz signal. So there is a cavity that ultimately gets embedded in this system to reduce that noise. Microcombs or micro resonator frequency combs are kind of the third class of devices that have uh, just exploded in the past decade. And the basic idea of how they work is to build up and contain light in a small micro resonator in a whispering gallery mode in such a resonator and rely on four wave mixing where you could have two of the input pump photons that are of a specific frequency and you can have um, parametric four wave mixing that would then give you two side bands and then this process can cascade to get multiple side bands and, and thus build up a comb. So the, the real key factors here are that you, you need high Q, high quality factors, because these are small devices and you, you like them to operate at, at relatively small powers. So quality factors up to a billion or so are, are regularly found. Um, and a small cross section confines the light tightly so that you would get um, high intensities. And, and as I'll mention in, in you know, some subsequent slides, these give the possibility to, to geometrically control the modes that the light propagates in. So you can engineer the dispersion and then, and, and then of course the, the big dream is to integrate all of this on a chip. And in fact, here on the right, you see kind of a, a gallery of different micro resonators, some being kind of machined glass resonators or machine crystalline resonators down to devices that are, you know, basically photonic integrated circuits that are lithographically patterned and etched and fabricated on chip. And, and there's a tremendous amount of work in this, in this field. An early uh, review paper and then more recent review papers have come out on that and, and large variety of materials and, and different platforms that people are exploring there. One of the most, uh, you know, besides being practical devices, these, these micro resonator cones, they're also kind of an interesting nonlinear, um, a nonlinear experiment, a playground for studying nonlinear optics. And that was realized by the group of Tobias Kippenberg, who have a, a very nice um, review article on this topic of the capability to generate Kerr solitons inside these, these resonators. And that would be a soliton, it's kind of like a hyperbolic secant shape that surfs on a continuous wave background inside such a cavity. In the frequency domain, that gives you this kind of very characteristic hyperbolic secant spectra. You see the remnant of the pump laser there in the center 
that's the energy that's being pumped into the cavity that provides kind of this background. And this very simple equation can then describe the, the dynamics and in fact, very accurately predict the type of frequency comb that you can generate based on you know, measurements or the parameters of loss and, and detuning of the pump light from one of the resonances, the Kerr nonlinearity and dispersion. So, so that's perhaps more dramat most dramatically showed where you can build and model resonators that look like this. So, so light would be introduced along a waveguide here, this, um, one shown at the top to couple into a resonator, and this is silicon nitride platform, and the light would be trapped in there. And by engineering the, and what you're seeing here on the right is a cross section of that waveguide, but by engineering the dimensions of that waveguide, you can change the dispersion. And when you do that, that allows you, for example, to broadcast a comb over extremely broad bandwidth. So here we kind of have these, this wonderful octave spanning comb that allows one to in fact self-reference these types of combs and again make that, that tight gear-like connection between optical and microwave domains. And you can see that the, the, the output that one gets is actually very well described by theory. So this theory again involves just these few simple parameters that were shown on the previous slide. And if you vary, for example, the ring width, um, the, the cross section of the waveguide, you can see that you can push, for example, the, these dispersive waves or what they're called, you know, to longer or shorter wavelengths. So that's a very powerful, um, one of the most powerful aspects of the integrated photonics platforms that allow you to dig dispersion engineer and generate kind of tailored frequency cones. Okay, so in, in the last 15 minutes or so, I'll, I'll switch gears a bit and tell you about some applications and how we've been using those. And that's, you know, I enjoy for myself building the devices and, and but it's, it's the most fun to actually use them for some sort of um, precision uh, measurement. So some time ago or 10 years ago now, I um, wrote a paper in Joseph B where it, it became clear to me that, you know, frequency combs were not just about measuring optical frequencies or building optical clocks, but rather there's a, a wide range of applications that they have enabled and, and different branches of, of a tree, if you'd like. And this is a little more of a, a modern version of that or a newer version with kind of a living tree with maybe the, the self-referencing aspect, the key, key gear work at the center of this, the heart, if you would, heart and lungs of this tree, then, and then roots and going down to different technologies I described to you, and branches and, and leaves extending up to many different applications. So there are some applications that you just could not do without a frequency comb. And that's, for example, making an optical clock. I told you we can now generate extremely low noise microwave signals. In fact, the lowest noise microwave signals that now exist come from optical resonators or optical oscillators that have their frequency divided down to the microwave very broad band sensitive and accurate spectroscopy. Um, frequency combs are now being used to find Earth-like exoplanets. So I'll tell you a little bit about that. And, and this topic that I won't touch on, but you know, the generation of pulses with controlled carrier envelope phase. So really they allow you know, control over the electromagnetic waveform of light that before this time was only possible at much lower frequencies in the microwave domain. So let me tell you a little bit about a few of these applications and starting with optical clock metrology. And this is, this is really kind of core to say the, the, the functioning of an institute like NIST, and that is looking for, you know, at, at one level, what might be the next definition of the second, but on the other hand, also looking at um, basic physics uh, or even earth science that one can do when you can measure frequencies to the 18th digit. So, so what you're seeing here is data from a recent comparison, and you can read about this. This is our Boulder Atomic Clock and Optical Network team, Bacon. It's a very appropriate name for Boulder because not many people in our town eat bacon if you've ever been here. And they're more likely to be running up and down the mountains. Um, 
But anyway, we use frequency combs to compare three of the most accurate and precise clocks that exist anywhere in the world. These are the strontium, ytterbium, and aluminum ion clocks. And so here the frequency comb is functioning as a gear work to measure the ratio between these optical frequencies. And these are the kind of data that we, we get. And our, our, our most recent points, maybe the most notable thing, is that the air bars are a factor of 10 or so smaller than any previous work. And in fact, these are now the most accurately defined or accurately measured quantities of any physical parameter that I'm aware of. There, there have been measurements of, you know, uh, confirmations of zero effects or null effects in physics, you know, where someone is measuring zero or maybe someone is, is saying, uh, you know, the charge of an electron to uh, a proton, is it really exactly minus one? So discounting those kind of measurements, I think these are the most precisely number, precisely and accurately measured numbers that exist now to date of any physical parameter. And that is the, the ratio of the energy levels in these three um, atomic systems. So that's pretty exciting. And, and at a place like NIST, you know, that's figuring into a future redefinition of the SI second. You know, the SI second's now based on cesium clocks, but it's going to change here in, in the next decade, I think. It allows one to do things like relativistic geodesy. Alexei measure, mentioned early on that, you know, this kind of precision corresponds to centimeter changes in um, gravitational potential. So one could use these clocks as kind of leveling devices. And actually, we think that could be a really important practical application in the future as more and more ice around the world melts. And people want to know, where is the water going to flow? So water follows gravity. And so measuring gravity very precisely could actually have huge um, practical importance. But, but on the, the physics side, I mentioned, you know, people who are interested and others are interested in using these kinds of clocks as, as maybe future observatories for, for detection, perhaps, of dark matter, for constraining uh, models of physics, looking for gravitational waves, um, maybe, you know, even forming large observatories that, that could, could look at um, things like uh, black holes, the event horizons, oh. In, um, in different systems at different wavelengths or frequencies. So I think there's, there's a lot in the fundamental side that these tools allow. A very practical kind of device would be build, using frequency combs in combination with, with ultra small um, atomic uh, chip uh, cells or vapor cells, such as this very small rubidium cell just a few millimeters across to build chip scale optical clocks. And, and those would be interesting, for example, um, to operate in, in environments where you don't have GPS, or um, people are interested in using those as, you know, you can turn it around, not just as a clock, but maybe as a sensor of magnetic fields. And so this kind of technology that allows you to, to connect with a comb, the optical transition, say, of rubidium to the microwave, could be very powerful from a technological point of view. And this was a demonstration that we did, uh, came out just last year, where we showed for the first time with these chip scale components, we could make such a clock that had actually a pretty good uh, stable microwave output. So this microwave output is linked to a two photon transition in rubidium. And, you know, this is a kind of performance that um, you know, commercially, it's, it's kind of a, a rack scale cesium fountain clock, or cesium clock, excuse me, cesium beam clock that, that has, you'd have to go to to have kind of comparable performance. So that's pretty interesting to, to be able to realize in uh, chip scale devices that involve these cones. A, a topic that I, I really enjoy and am actively involved in is using frequency combs to search for exoplanets. Um, the 2019 Nobel Prize, of course, went to Mayor and Culot for their um, introduction and discovery of exoplanet orbiting a solar type star. They used this radial velocity technique where you uh, would look at a star and if there's an exoplanet circling the star, it, it tugs the star to and fro 
such that as you observe the stellar spectrum from Earth, you see it periodically redshifted and blue shifted as the exoplanet goes around. And this is, in fact, the signature of the, the Doppler shift of this um, 51 peg, I think, was the star that they, they looked at and found the first exoplanet, or found an exoplanet around, and that was the first solar type star. But if you want to find an Earth-Sun analog, it's very hard to do because the Doppler shift uh, is on the scale of 10 centimeters per second. You might see here, this is 50 meters per second. So you have to go kind of a factor of, of uh, you know, 100 to 1,000 better precision if you wanted to see an Earth-Sun analog. So that, that's, that's a very interesting and active area of research in astronomy, you know, to, to answer really these big questions. If, how do planets form and evolve? Are they diverse? Is your Earth unique? And ultimately, is there life elsewhere? So I have a, a project that's running right now out in West Texas at the McDonald Observatory with a group from Penn State, um, University of Texas, and, and several uh, University of Arizona, several other institutes. And that's um, called the Habitable Zone Planet Finder. And this is an instrument that, that sits below the Hobby Everly Telescope, a big 10 meter class telescope out there. We have a frequency comb that every night is calibrating the spectra of near infrared stars, M stars. So those would be stars not like our Earth. So a, a bit of a different question being sought to answer there is, is to study planetary systems and exoplanets around cooler stars, which actually close by in our, in our galaxy are the most numerous stars. And so it's a very interesting class of stars to study. And we've been doing that now every night for about two and a half years and looking up into the West Texas sky there. So that's been a really exciting experiment. And a frequency comb is, is enabling actually over the past couple of years, you know, new astrophysics and new science to come out of this experiment. And here's a few examples that show you kind of the technology. We use this electro-optic comb technology to make a 30 gigahertz comb. The, the spectrum in the end looks something like a purple spectrum down here. There you aren't resolving modes. If you zoomed in, you could actually see the modes. We use some of this nanophotonics to generate this spectrum with very low um, pulse energy. And when combined with the telescope and the, and the habitable zone planet finder spectrograph, one gets images like this. So this is the kind of stellar spectra it's kind of an echelogram, we call it, where you would look at the spectra of the star and you almost read it like a book from long wavelength to short wavelength. And if you zoom in there, you can see the stellar spectrum. It looks kind of continuous, maybe with some dark notches out of it. And underneath it is the tick marks, which are our frequency comb. And this is allowing us to, for example, look at Barnard star. There's some controversy right now, whether there might be a planet or not around Barnard star or other stars. And, and make the very most precise measurements that have ever been made in the near infrared region of the spectrum. Um, I'll just finish up here with a, a quick comment on another topic that I'm quite excited about is, is doing frequency cone spectroscopy from the UV to the terahertz. And, and this is really the idea of, well, could you in a sim, single simple frequency cone device have millions of laser lines you know, anywhere in the optical UV, near infrared and infrared region of the spectrum that you, that you would want. And you would use that to do, for example, precision atomic molecular spectroscopy for a variety of applications. So this is, this is a paper we put on the archive just recently that describes the techniques that allow us to make um, exceedingly broad uh, frequency comb spectra, starting with just a very robust and technologically mature laser system in the telecom band. So one thing that we've been particularly interested in is looking at infrared region of the spectrum. So, so if, if you go out here, and, and I should mention this, this region of the spectrum, it's really the molecular fingerprint region. And so, you know, we're, we're interested in looking at trace gases, but also in, in bio and uh, chemical systems that would be important for health, perhaps, um, materials, and um, you know, new quantum materials, for example, would be interesting to look at as well. 
But th this region of the spectrum, um, the bandwidth, the combination of bandwidth and power that we get now exceeds that of a synchrotron. So that's, that's something that gets folks around Boulder who we work with quite excited because they don't have to pack up their experiment and go to Berkeley. They could actually imagine doing those experiments um, in the laboratory with a modest, you know, one meter square apparatus instead of hundreds of meters squared that you'd need for the synchrotron. So here, here's an example of, of spectroscopy we've done in this region, you know, over kind of 600 inverse centimeter to, you know, 1500. So this is, this is much over an octaves, kind of spanning 15 to, uh, you know, from four or five microns out to 15 microns. And the ability to, to have kind of this combination of very broad spectral grass and very high resolution down to individual comb teeth. So each in this plot in the bottom right, each dot on that plot is a single, is the amplitude of a single comb tooth. We can also measure the phase of it. So we can do kind of dispersive spectroscopy as well. But it kind of extends over a dynamic range and frequency of about a factor of a million. I, I won't really have time to talk about it, but, but because infrared detectors aren't so great and um, we've developed a technique that allows one to measure in real time. So kind of like a, a sampling oscilloscope would do in for electronic signals, we can do for these signals with frequencies up to about 100 terahertz. We can sample them um, with near infrared, very short pulses, and, and in fact measure the, the directly the electric field of the infrared light. And that's how these spectra arise is out of the, the Fourier transform of that electric field. So I think that's bringing me close to the end. I just wanted to wrap up by telling you, you know, maybe a few ideas on what the future might hold. You know, I think one of the, as I already alluded to, one of the most exciting developments is, is you know, frequency combs on a chip and this idea of, of further and further integrating them, you know, so that maybe in the future they would look something like, uh, direct digital synthesis chip. This is an AD9833 that you can buy for about 15 bucks from DigiKey that allows you in the RF domain to, to um, digitally uh, generate electromagnetic signals in the RF domain. Here would be a device that could do it in the optical domain. And you can see this is work from colleagues who work with it at Santa Barbara led by John Bowers of the hard task of integrating it. But I, I might hold this out as kind of that analog for frequency combs of the, the first Bell Labs transistor that looked a, a little bit, um, you know, duct tape and bailing wire held together. But I think this is really uh, going to be a breakthrough and an exciting path forward as one moves towards more fuller integrated devices. You know, wh what else might combs do? I mean, the field has continued to surprise, so it's, it's hard to predict, but here's an interesting idea from Thomas Udom and Akira Ozawa as well. You know, we worked hard to make combs with equal spacing. What if we could make them with unequal spacing? And this would be a comb that, that the, the spacing of the modes increased as you go across, increased linearly as you went across the, the optical spectrum. So here's an idea, a proposal on how you might do that. I don't think it's been realized yet, but that's a pretty interesting idea because that could enable, for example, a direct mapping just by measuring the mode spacing, which is easy to do. You could directly map optical frequencies to the microwave domain. So this could be an interesting tool, for example, for, for spectroscopy. But as, as we zoom back out to this big picture, you know, I think, you know, we're going to continue to see frequency combs at extreme wavelengths in the X-ray, more IR. I think those are, you know, very interesting domains. Combs in extreme environments. I think they're going to space. They will go to space with clocks. Ubiquitous combs, so the CMOS kind of integrated combs. Quantum combs is, is a topic, of course, that, that is gaining attention. You know, what could you do with the quantum properties of light in a frequency comb? Or, or maybe it'll be something else that, that we just don't even know anything about right now. So that, would, that might be the best one, uh, is the surprise. So with that, I'd just like to thank, um, you know, the many people I work with 
you know, not only people in my own group, but many other staff and postdocs and collaborators around the world. And of, sport, of course, give um, Jan Hall and Ted Hench a big thank you for initiating this field and, and giving me the opportunity to work in it. And if, if you're interested in reading more, um, myself and Carrie Bahala and Thomas Udom wrote a, a review article that kind of captures a lot of the story I just related to you um, in this, uh, in this uh, recent publication in Science. So I think with that, I'll, I'll um, stop and be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Scott. Please questions, please just unmute yourself and ask and ask your questions. Can I go ahead and ask a question? Sure. Yes, Can please. you do some more to compare uh, to the synchrotron source? Um, you, have, you have the wavelengths uh, and the yeah, here, I'll, of the I'll go back to that slide. Yeah, what about power, pulse yeah. duration? Uh, let's see how we got to back up here a few slides. Yeah, I, I what else do they care about? Oh. Yeah, this plot. So, so I did not in here. If if you go to this paper on the archive, the 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 direct um, comparison is made in the plot in the paper. Mm -hmm. But right now, you know, in this region across the, you know, the three to 20 micron region, we are about 10 times brighter than the synchrotron and, or, or at least as bright. And so um, I think that, that that's pretty nice for like a tabletop kind of setup. You know, the, the bandwidth is, is, you know, the synchrotron is, is probably still broader bandwidth or doesn't have maybe some dips like we have here. This is some dip between two different nonlinear crystals. But in terms of the, the brightness, we're comparable and, and now with our latest experiments, even a factor of 10 or more brighter than the synchrotron. So there, there's even more ambitious experiments in Germany, the group of Ferenc Krauss, where they're, they're building even bigger laser systems and getting, you know, hundreds of milliwatts of power. So the, the power that might be integrated in, in these kind of reddish spectra here might be five milliwatts. So they can do even more power. But one thing I like is, is this is a very simple um, erbium fiber system that we use to drive this. So, so yeah, I, if, if you, uh, I would just encourage you, if you want to know the exact numbers, to look at that paper there. I, yes. I think the, the, the repetition rate is 100 megahertz. So yeah, the, probably the, the properties of the pulse light are a little different than the synchrotron. Might be, um, you know, I don't, I don't quite know kind of how the electron bunches, you know, what their timing is exactly. Um, but I think certainly we have better beam quality coming out. We kind of have laser beam quality, so it could be refocused kind of to diffraction limit. So that's, that's something I think that is, is quite nice as well. Thank you. Sure, yeah. More questions, please. Uh, hi, I, I wanted to ask a little bit about the x-ray combs and how far out do you think those are? And maybe you can say a little bit more about their uh, difficulties and limitations. Yeah. Yeah, may maybe I'll just stay on this slide. I I'm not making x-rays with my combs, but um, my colleague Jun Yi is, and they can get it's still a ways from x-rays, you know, but they're, they're kind of down in the tens of nanometer range. So that would be starting with a, a laser comb that maybe is at one micron and generating, you know, 20th harmonic of that. And the powers have been going up and, and, and how they do that. And, and I'd be, if you reach out to me, I'd be happy to, to get you in contact with June or refer you to some of his papers. But the way they do that is they would they would build they would use an enhancement cavity to build up the power of the frequency comb and then a gas jet inside that enhancement cavity to generate harmonics coherent harmonics and they've been able to do spectroscopy down to kind of eighty nanometers or so and um, so I think I think people are definitely interested in pushing that and and the reason I held out X rays is that um, there's um, I. You know, if you think beyond optical clocks, the, the one 
arrow in timekeeping that has been true for decades has been to go to higher frequencies. And so if you want to make a, I think the next generation clocks after optical clocks will be clocks that are based on even higher trans, higher frequency transitions. And in fact, there's a very interesting one in thorium. It's a, it's a nuclear optical clock where there's, there's kind of a freak of nature, I would say, where there's a, tra there's a, a nuclear transition in thorium that's accessible now it's about 150 nanometers, 160 nanometers. No one has, has found it exactly, but this holds out promise that if we could understand how to probe those systems, you know, maybe at in the 100 nanometer range, that maybe in the future, one could go to even um, higher and higher frequencies. So, so that's a bit of the perspective there. There aren't X-ray frequency combs yet, but, but maybe it's, it's DUV or XUV. That's really cool, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. More questions, please. May I ask you a question while you are thinking? So can you elaborate a little bit on the quantum combs? Because at first sight, it sounds like a paradoxical concept, right? If you have spontaneously generated single photon pulses, right? Then now you are subject to quantum fluctuation from pulse to pulse. So you're kind of losing this strictly periodic nature of classical life consisting of a sequence of pulses. Yeah. Yeah, I, I honestly would have to say, and I'm, I'm not a, there, yourself or others would probably be able to even uh, address these questions better, but, but you know, the, I, so I'm not an expert on, on quantum optics, but I know that, that people are trying to think about that, a particular colleague in, in Virginia, Olivier Pfister, there's some groups in, in Paris that are looking at that, and, and really trying to understand you know, kind of Olivier's experiments are to use below threshold OPOs to generate photon pairs and then have kind of um, massive correlations of multiple pairs of photons across broad bandwidths. And there's even some scenarios that one, at least theoretically, people have used those for to kind of predict scenarios for, for quantum information processing. So, so I think it's a it's a very new and speculative field. I would say at the moment is you know what could one do with combining quantum optics and frequency combs? And I, I would have to say that at least from my perspective, it's a little unclear where it's going to go. But I, I hold it out there as an interesting an interesting topic. One one thing that that I personally am very interested in is in protect in particular this mid infrared light. And I, I didn't talk about that. Is we can we can generate single cycle pulses of light. And I would like to understand, you know, not only their, their, their properties, the statistics of those fields, you know, at the quantum limit, but there's been some kind of um, perhaps a little bit controversial papers, um, the group of Alfred Leitenstorfer, but, but really interesting papers, provocative papers that, that talk about squeezing and generating of, generation of squeeze states in few cycle pulses. And so I think that could be a, another interesting idea that relates perhaps to our dual comb sampling where one could, could, could use that as a metrology tool perhaps. So, so there's a few nascent ideas, but I, I hold it out there as a bit speculative at the moment, at least from my perspective. It would be great. Thank you very that, much. Yeah. Good, good, please. It would be great to have more input from people like you who, you know, have the quantum background to, to help us think about these as an experimentalist. It's extremely exciting times for sure. Any, any more questions, please? All right, I think we had a lot. So if there are no more questions, let's thank uh, uh, Scott again for his wonderful talk and presentation, which I'm sure will be also available because I know that Ryan has yeah. been recording it. And um, so let's just adjourn. And uh, I know that Scott, you have a couple of more meetings, so. yeah. Okay, yeah, I think I'll, I'll see a few people in the next few minutes. So yeah, thank you very much. I really appreciate you arranging it. Thanks for the game. Thank you very much. Yeah, bye-bye.